I'm Lisa Bilyeu and I went from housewife to co-founder the billion dollar company Quest Nutrition and now president of Impact Theory. Our mission with this show is to empower you and all women to recognize you really can become the hero of your own life. Welcome to Women of Impact. If you took a cup of Anna Winter's fashion instinct, a spoonful of Oprah Winfrey's vision and a litre of Maya Angelou's heart and drive for impact, put it in a bowl and baked it, well, it still wouldn't be as nourishing to our hearts and souls as today's guest. After graduating college and interning at CBS in New York, she no longer could deny her passion and pull towards fashion. So she took the bold move, packed up and moved to LA. But with no money or possessions, she filled her suitcase with hope. She filled her suitcase with her dreams. She filled it with the belief that she was following her purpose. And, well, it didn't take long before she began making waves as a stylist for music videos featuring superstars Kanye West and Kerry Hilson. Then taking on the role as fashion influencer and brand manager of her brother's clothing line, Fear of God, she was finally beginning to flex her creative muscles. But our purpose is our compass. And over time, she found herself getting lost in her job title and position. That's when she realized that her worth and value was tied up in what she did, not who she was. And she wasn't alone. She realized it was an epidemic. So she set out to cut through the noise and cliches we see in society, to unveil and dismantle the lies being told in social media that is causing depression and anxiety in today's world. And that's when Now With Natalie was born a six-part interview series on the Hillsong channel. Today's Women of Impact discusses everything from fashion, modeling, and entertainment to sports and mental health with today's leading icons. From model Hailey Bieber to music legend Kelly Rowland to NBA star Tyson Chandler, she dives deep in candid conversations to explore how they navigate their lives in the spotlight while maintaining their true purpose and identity. So please help me in welcoming the woman who is handing out the antidote to the compare and compete epidemic, the spiritual and empowering badass who is shaking up our perception of identity in social media one episode at a time, the trailblazer herself, Natalie Manuel Lee. Oh, wow. <laughs> Welcome to the <laughs> show. You. I actually want to start with a quote of yours that hit me so hard yeah. and I think it will kind of set up the whole interview. Let's do it. How do you discover your own sense of self within both legacy and competition? Oof. Oh my God, you, that hit me so hard. So the reason why I want to start here mm -hmm. is, let's talk about the legacy of our, like as we build our identity growing up, we have that weight on mm -hmm. us. So how do you think that that really contributes to who we become and then also then the comparison of the people that follow us and how do we change or how do we um, construct our identity? Yeah, I think that, like you said in the intro, we think that our value and our worth and our legacy, if you will, is defined by what we do, the clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the money in our account, um, the relationships that we have that we do or don't have, and just overall what we appear to be. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with looking fly. We talked about each other's outfits <laughs> earlier. Yeah. It's nothing wrong with wearing name brand things and it's nothing wrong with wanting to be a successful, you know, NBA star, or fashion designer or a model. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's dangerous when we allow it to define us. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous when we say that this is who we are because of these things. It's the complete opposite. You know, I say all the time that you don't have to earn your identity. You get to experience it. So you don't have to earn feeling like you need to put a stamp on the world. You already are that because of where you were born into and where you were born from. And I always say if you don't know who you are, if you don't know where you're from, you'll never know why you're here. Mm -hmm. So the, I think the tricky thing of what legacy do we hope to leave, mm -hmm. I think that it becomes diluted, if you will, in something that we think that the world's legacy wants us mm -hmm. to leave. In our reality, it's just a legacy of who you are and how you live your life. Yeah, I love that so much because when you said legacy, like that word really hit me because I thought about the legacy that like my parents have are leaving and the legacy that my grandparents are leaving. And I feel somewhat, or at least I used to feel somewhat mm -hmm. the pressure to make sure that I live up to the legacy that they've left. Um, 
take me through when you started working with your brother. Yeah. Did you feel like you had a legacy to fill? Um, and then what was that transition looking like where you started to really look at your own identity and realizing that, okay, that wasn't um, what path you wanted to take? Sure, that's a great question. So before my brother called one day, I'll never forget, and I was in the car and he was like, hey, what do you think about coming alongside and working with me and fear God? Hung up immediately, I was like, absolutely not. Oh. Just for the sake of, it's my brother, we're super close. Mm. I don't want that relationship, anything, you know, to just, something could happen, you know, because we are so close. But instinctively, I knew that I had to do it after I said verbally no. Because not only was it a place where it humbled me, but I was called to serve my brother in that time. Mm. And I was called to help build build his brand. So with that, I worked with him for three and a half years, the best experience I've ever had because there were so many things that I learned in that experience that I can now apply to today and where I'm at in the season that I'm in. Um, did I get lost? I don't think I knew that I got lost in my identity and in my profession until the transition of not being there anymore. Okay. So I transitioned out of not working at fear of God and then that I was jobless, but I knew that, you know, God was telling me it's time for you to transition out. It's time for you to do something different, but I didn't necessarily know what that was. Can you explain what that feeling is like? Mm -hmm. You just know that, you know, like that, that feeling that you get in your stomach, if you're supposed to turn left, if you're supposed to turn right. So in that period of just transitioning and not working there anymore, I went into a deep, deep depression. But in that depression, I kept asking God, what is the catalyst of this depression? Because around me, everything is good. So it's not situational depression. It's not necessarily, I don't think it's a chemical imbalance. You know, I don't think it's any of those things. But I had a rude awakening. One morning he said, the reason why I have you in this season right now is for you to realize that your identity and your purpose is not tied to what you do. And what you, the reason why you kept continuing at fear of God is because your value and your worth was in what you did. Mm -hmm. I need you to learn how to just be in me as opposed to the doing. But with that, like you said in the intro, it was the birth of now with Natalie, realizing that I'm not the only one that deals with this. And there is an epidemic that is going on in our world with feeling that our worth and value are tied to all these other things, but in the one thing that it should be in. So I'm really grateful for that season of depression and isolation mm -hmm. because I had the awakening, but I never want to go back to it. Oh, it's wow. definitely, you know, it was a really tough experience, but he showed me, this is why you feel what you feel because your, your value is in something that cannot feed what you want internally. I always say we're looking for an external win mm -hmm. to satisfy the internal longing. And we look for those things to make us feel a certain way. Yeah, that's so true. And here's the problem, because when something happens and it makes you feel good, you're like, oh my God, that's great. It made me feel so good. So you right. lean into it. Sure. So how do you avoid that being the be all and end all to the meaning of yourself? That's so, I actually just had a conversation with somebody the other day about that. We all need encouragement. Right. So, but it's dangerous when we allow that encouragement to be the stamp on our identity. Okay. So there's the difference. You, we need to encourage each other, but if we're seeking that out to make us feel good, that's, that's not good. Mm -hmm. That's where you know that it's becoming a problem, it's becoming a crutch. Yeah. So again, it's almost like the encouragement should just be confirmation. Ah, oh, I like that. That you are doing good, that you are the, you know, the bad woman that you are, that you are the strong woman, mm. that you are an impactful woman. It should just confirm what you should already know. Mm. And so it keeps you going. We all need it. Like it, it helps you, you know, push the needle a little bit further. But when it stamps you and it makes you feel better about yourself as opposed to confirming, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, I found myself spending, uh, God, maybe three or four years doing something Same. that I was miserable at because I was getting the pat on the back. Did you find the same? A hundred percent. I think T.D. Jake says, even if it's not the thing, it's leading to the thing. So there's certain things that we need to do in life, regardless if it doesn't look like our purpose or not. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing it for the sake of feeling a void, you're doing it for the wrong reason. But if you're doing it knowing that you need to be in that season in your life, knowing that there's some things that you need in that season in order to sustain for you for what's to come, mm -hmm. 
then stay in it. But if you're doing it just to, that's an issue. Right. So how do you coach yourself through that? So do you personally set a goal or this is my purpose and then do a plan to get there so that in those small moments, even if it's not the thing, you're telling yourself, but it's the thing that's going to get me to the thing. Daily. It's a daily, it's a daily thought shift. It's a daily perspective. I mean, I, I had the awakening, but you have to work yeah. at staying and knowing that that is what it is and you have to believe it. So every morning, I mean, I, I pray, I put on my worship, I put on the armor, but I also have to shift my perspective every morning. I believe that we're always in a spiritual battleground, if you will. There's always mm-hmm. warfare. And I think that a lot of times doing the work that we're doing You know, there's attacks that happen spiritually as opposed to physically. And, you know, those oppositions that we may feel daily or those mental attacks that we might have, Mm. you know, perspective wise that we don't feel like we're a certain thing. Mm. But putting on the armor helps protect from those things. Things are still going to come. You know what I mean? Things are still going to come, but it helps. It, It definitely helps. And you know that you're covered. It's almost like when you go out for war, you know, if you go out to the battleground and if you don't have the proper weapons, you can tremble. You can yeah. fall. You, you might not win the war. Well, you, know, you might not win the battle. Mm. So that's the point of the armor. Yeah. Don't take a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> you can't. What are you going to do? <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, you've discovered yourself. Um, okay, it's actually not what I do. That's the wrong perspective. Sure. Take me through how you then developed the idea of this new series that you're doing. Like, How did you come about developing that? I mean, it's so incredible. Well, I saw the need, you know, obviously just the plight of humanity and where we are as a culture and as a generation. And obviously, like you said, the purpose of the show is to really nullify, dismantle, pull back the veils of the counterfeits of identity and purpose that are being sold to our generation. Mm -hmm. And I think that grabbing the people that are at the top of their industry to really pull back that veil was my strategy hey, we glorify these people because of the position as opposed to the purpose of their position. I love that. And I need you guys to hear what they have to say Mm -hmm. because it's not what you think. That's the hashtag of the show. So grabbing people like, you know, Haley or Jerry Lorenzo or Kelly Rowland to really speak their truth and letting them not only give their story and their perspective behind it, but setting people free and letting people know that, hey, my the reason why Kelly Rowland said it in, in her interview, she realized that it's not about the number ones. There's a bigger why to what I'm doing. My brother's quote in the show was, if I, if I, if I came here just to do clothes, it's pretty empty inside. There's a bigger why. So the whole point of the show is, hey, by the way, it's not to consume all these things and to get the highest level in your industry. Once you get to the highest level of your industry, to much is given, much is required, you have a responsibility. And that responsibility is doing something bigger with what you have. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, and I really felt it in watching it. Um, I don't like the word fault, but I'm going to use it. Whose fault is it um, that that society is like that now? Because... I really struggle with this. Part of me is kind of like, we do it to ourselves. We're the ones that glorify these people and put them on a pedestal. Um, And so is it us? Is it the person that should be like, hang on a minute, actually that's not me. But at the same time, you look at somebody like Haley, who is stunningly beautiful. And from the outside, she looks like she is the perfect specimen of a human being sure um but it wasn't until your documentary that i personally saw the other side to her Mm -hmm. so is it society is it us as the consumer or is it the person as the celebrity whose responsibility is to be continuously unveiling the truth i think it's both i think it's twofold i think that we have people in these celebrity positions that eat it up Mm -hmm. because of their ego because they're thinking that their value and their worth are, are in the validation of the world and their fame. Mm-hmm. So that's their, they have a responsibility. And then us, we, you know, we're, we're living in a social media saturated society right now. So everything that we see, 90% of it is fabricated. So it's our responsibility to protect ourselves that if we know that, you know, maybe these certain things might affect us or bother us, or maybe we start, we'll glorify these people more than we really should. So I think it's I think it's definitely twofold, but again, the responsibility of these people in these positions, that's the whole point. Like you said, you had a different perspective on Haley. 
She knows why she has her platform. Jerry knows why he has his platform. Kelly knows. Angela knows. You know, everybody that was on the show, they know. But some people may not. And hopefully that this series can awaken the people that are at the top to realize why they do have their platform. Yeah. Um, the words you use are so beautiful and hard hitting. I don't know how much you do that on purpose, but like identity counterfeit, for instance. Yeah. Like just that phrase I've <laughs> never heard before. And I was like, it's so really? true. And it kind of like really stirred something up inside me. I actually mm. think I might have a quote regarding that. Our perception of self is conditioned by an overload of imagery and information about the lives of others. Um, and so thinking about yes. that. And talk, yeah, talk to me about that. It's just that our perception is what other people, you know, we, we want to consume all these things because that's what we think the world says that we need. Mm. We think that the world is saying this because the world is saying this. But the whole point of the series is to really dismantle as much as we can of this mm. false narrative. It's false, but we're dying. I believe that success has killed more people than cancer. Whoa. Because of the amount of things that we think that we need in order to feel successful mm -hmm. inside. You know what I mean? It's like we're grabbing on all these things to make ourselves feel whole, feel pure, and trying to climb up a ladder thinking that contentment and peace lie ahead. In our reality, it's at the bottom of the ladder. Mm -hmm. In order for you to climb that ladder, you have to find yourself and know yourself. You can't climb the ladder to find yourself. You have to know yourself in order to climb the ladder. That's amazing. So what did you learn in doing this show? Um, obviously you had a very clear vision when you started about mm -hmm. what you were trying to do. What did your evolution look like throughout the episodes? It was almost confirmation that I knew the power of telling your story. I think a lot of us think that we need to just put on this facade like we always talk about but when Kelly and Jerry and Tyson when they told their story it was so freeing for me mm. it felt like I wasn't alone mm. you know and that's the whole point of the the show is like we're all on the same journey it doesn't matter the platform it doesn't matter the title that we have and so it just it reminded me of the power of telling your story and I always say the greatest way to serve is to tell your story yeah. Well, your story about um, how you and your brother took um, shoes and clothes to Skid Row was so powerful. Like, that mm. hit me so hard. So what did it mean to you to be there and to witness that? <sighs> Humbling. You know, to shift your perspective. Again, it just goes back to that perspective shift. Like, how am I over here moaning about it was traffic and I was rushing and I was almost late? And they're over here trying to figure out how they're going to be able to cover their feet and the shoes that they have and, and, the, and the clothes and, you know, what they're going to eat and so forth and so forth. It's like we have to realize that it's not about all these other things. Mm. Um, Poet, the guy in, in Jerry's episode, oh, took my breath away. He said one thing. He said, I have a dollar sixty-eight in my pocket, but I'm one of the richest men in the world. He's saying that he's rich because he has the joy. He has the peace. And peace to him is riches and success. Mm. And so, again, I think in that, even being there and being around them and seeing the need, it just it awakens you to realize that, you know, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And it's not about us. Mm. Nothing is about us. Do you always put yourself in positions then that you can um, adapt your perspective? Oh, yeah. I think you have to always meet people where they are. Mm. You won't be able to affect, you won't be able to impact if you can't meet them where they are. And how do you do that? I believe that you have to take yourself out of it. Mm. You cannot judge. Take the lenses off. Ask yourself to see them the way that God sees them. Yeah. And that's how you'll be able to meet them where they are. No judgment, no nothing. Take the lenses off. Meet them where they are. Yeah, it's so difficult to not have um, instinctual judgment on people, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. like, I catch myself a lot, like even just like, well, I'm a woman, so and I'm like, why did they just say I'm a woman, so? Like that makes no, di you know, like yeah. it goes back to like, wow, my perspective, like I still catch myself in judging the fact that I'm a woman, so this means this. It's hard. 
like I don't have it down pat. Yeah. I'm still, it's still a daily thing for me because it's who am I to judge you and who are you to judge me? Mm. But it, you're right. It's like embedded in us yeah. for some way, somehow. But I think that there's a lot of things that we've learned in our life that we picked up that are bad habits that now it's time for us to undo those things. Mm -hmm. And for me, yeah, it's, it is judgment because who, who are we to judge? Yeah. What was the biggest thing growing up did you find was the, um, um, let's say, judgment put upon you that you had to overcome? My dad was a successful baseball player, so he was in the Major League, Major League Baseball, and I think a lot of people would think that I was probably spoiled or mm -hmm. had it all or didn't have to want for anything. It was a complete opposite. I was fighting to find myself because, again, I was defined by Jerry Manuel's daughter. So I know that a lot of people cast a lot of judgment on me and my family um, and my parents just because of the platform mm. that they were given. So, oh, they have it all together. No, we actually don't. It's the complete opposite. And because you are in the limelight, you have a microscope. Mm. So with that microscope, you're being judged even harder. Yeah. So growing up, you see the judgments put upon you um, and you're thinking this isn't who we really are. How do you work through that? Because it doesn't matter, I think, where you come from. Someone's going to judge you for something, the way you dress, the neighborhood you grew up in, the color of your skin, whatever gender you are. And so for you, it must have been very acute having a famous father. How did you find your own identity initially? Like, how did you get out of that? I don't think I did. I don't think no. I fully found my identity until mm. a couple of years ago. Hence the birth of now with Natalie. Mm. But I think too, even now in the recent years, I'm realizing that the people that are casting, casting judgment, there's a reason why they are. Mm. And I think that we have to, again, meet them where they are. We have to extend compassion. We have to extend empathy. We have to extend grace. And so if you feel like maybe somebody or something or a person or whomever is casting judgment on you, there's a deeper root in them. Mm. There's a deeper reason why they're doing it. And we're called to meet them where they are. So extend compassion. Yeah. Extend grace. Extend understanding. Yeah. That, to me, it's was... It's hard. It is. It is. It's hard. <laughs> but we got to do it. We got to do yeah. it. All right. Do you have an, one example in mind of where it was, like, really hard, but you were able to... Oh, um, my God, yeah. Somebody I worked with. Okay. Oh, my God. I just wanted to <laughs> strangle the person. But I had an awakening of what they were dealing with. So how do you have that awakening initially? I think I just discerned it, instinctively mm -hmm. felt it, kind of okay. knew. And I think just seeing how the person maybe lived their life or what they're doing or their, or their daily conversations, you can, you can he hear the pain. Mm -hmm. You can hear the hurt inside of them. So when hurt people hurt people. So when this person's either trying to cast judgment or hurt you back, it's you it's again you have the awakening of realizing okay you know what they're going through something and it was very difficult for me to extend grace and to extend compassion but I had to do it and then finally that person was released from me out of my life mm. do you mind take me a little deep on how you actually do that so extending the grace so um, like you said that's difficult to do killing them with kindness okay Knowing that even though inside you're oh a little frustrated, God, annoyed, inside, and mad, at I wanted to go in the bathroom <laughs> and cuss them out. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? But understanding, we have to be the we have to be the bigger person. Okay. We have to rise up and know that we're able to conquer this. And you know what I mean? And again, knowing nine times out of ten, that's really not that person. Mm. They're just dealing with something. It's just a season. So it's either killing them with kindness or asking them how they're doing. Mm. Do you need anything? That's very difficult. Mm. That's very hard. And the, the grace part is simply, you know, if there's something that they might have said something to you that you normally would react to, don't react. Just say, I hear you. Process it. And they'll get it. Let them, let them have the awakening. You don't need to be the one to mm. tell them about themselves. Mm. Let them be convicted and know when they've fallen short. That's really good, girl. <laughs> and but, it's hard. <laughs> um, are you able to do that immediately? Now I can. Okay. 
before absolutely not yeah i would react mm. like wait what what's wrong with you like what do you you know what i mean but now it's like okay this is not even about me there's something going on internally with them and if it is about you check yourself mm. and make sure that what did you do make sure you're accountable for your actions as well you know so that it's definitely twofold check yourself you, you might have made them feel this way so it's a daily thing so take me through then daily how you do that self-assessment where it's like, how did I do that? What did I do wrong or bring that to the, what did I bring to the table without it um, making you feel badly about yourself? To me, the power is in knowing that you did something wrong, mm. not what you did wrong. Mm, it's interesting. It's you knowing that you were in the wrong. There's so much humility in that. There's so much growth in that as opposed to what you did. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, there's, it's, it's different. So when you realize and know that you did it, you're growing right there. Now that you know that you did it, what, what steps are you going to take to change it? So I don't beat myself up before mm -hmm. I used to, right. but now it's like I'm grateful that I can see it. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful that I know. I'm grateful that I'm aware of it. And now that I'm aware of it, how do I change it? Because I don't want to be that person. You know, we all want to grow and evolve and be the best form of myself and yourself that we can be. I love that. Yeah, I always say to myself, like, all right, even though it's kind of stings when you have to admit to yourself, sure. like, okay, you uh, did something yeah. wrong. Like, that doesn't feel good at all. Mm -mm. But just by flipping it and saying, but now you can do something about it. Now you can fix it. Now you can be, be a better person or a better yeah. wife or a better business, you know, um, uh, partner or something like that yeah there's so much power and acceptance as opposed to denial mm -hmm. but we always go straight to the denial first yeah because we're ego yeah. we're ego driven <laughs> yeah, we don't we, we don't want to feel like we did anything wrong yeah. you know yeah. but your ego you know dies once you have humility mm -hmm. and you realize you know what i did mess up all right i'm aware of it now this is what i'll do different cool yeah i love that process and I love what you say is like, don't abort the process. Talk to me about that because most people do. I have in the past um, because it's like, oh, it's not working or this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel good. So I'm just going to like change direction. But you're like, don't like you need to trust in the process. Yeah. How do you trust in that process? I trust in the process by trusting in him. Okay. That's number one. But. The reason why my mantra now is don't abort the process because I'm living out what everything I've learned in the process is how I am here today talking to you. Right. And that process was sticky. It was muddy. It was, it, it just was awful. But there's so much grinding. There's so much things that are happening that are happening internally in you that you're growing. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's a better you today for a better you for tomorrow. And so the mantra is simply don't abort it. Like I said earlier, when T.D. Jake says, even if it's not mm. the thing, it's the thing leading to the thing. That has gotten me through the last 10 years of my life, knowing that maybe this is the season that I don't necessarily want to be in, but I know there's some tools. I know there's some things in this season that I have to learn to take me into the next season in my life, and I need to put those tools in my toolbox because we need the toolboxes for where we're going. Because if you abort it, you're gonna to have to go back to that lesson. You're gonna to have to go back to that season or you're just simply gonna stay in that season forever and never evolve, never grow. I, we need the process. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna take a hard ride and I wanna talk about fashion. Okay, go. So, <laughs> and go. Um, and go. Because, I mean, this all ties into you as a human, like what you believe in with identity and I love fashion now, mm -hmm. but when I was younger, I absolutely thought I was embarrassed to ever wear anything risky. I wanted to kind of like play under the radar because I never wanted to stand out. Yeah. And so a reflection of that was in everything that I wore. I wore the plainest clothes, mm -hmm. the completely unassuming um, outfits. And when I discovered who I was, when I went from being a housewife to building a business, that was when I saw a pivot in my clothing. And I didn't think about it at the time, mm. but it really was a reflection of what I was going through as a human being. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what fashion means to you and how you've seen it play out in people with their identity. It's a creative outlet, period, the end. I truly believe that it's an expression of yourself 
And when you, like you said, when you finally found out who you were and your identity, you're able to be bold. You're able to wear what you want to wear. You're, you're able to stand tall and feel, you know, feel as though whatever you are, you believe it. Mm. So I think for me, fashion, it evolves. And I think it's good to keep up with the trends if you like, but don't keep them up. Don't keep up with the trends if it just is going to make you feel good and that you're trendy. Wear what oh, you want okay. to wear. How do you, how do you differentiate the difference then? Because if it's a trend and so if, this is a pink cup and say if I love pink and the world loves pink, but if I don't love pink, mm. I don't have to wear it. Don't do something just because the world's telling you to do it. And obviously fashion is the epicenter of that. Like everybody wants to be on trend. Everybody wants to be cool. And I, I like to be on trend too, but I'm not going to do something just to fit in. Mm -hmm. So I, I find getting dressed, it's just liberating for me. It's simply like, all right, I'm, no one can tell me if I know it looks good and I think that it feels good then that's how I feel. And same with you. But I know that you can tell when people are wearing something to fit in. Mm. It's not who you are. Mm. You know what I mean? Like what you have on, this is my first day meeting you. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Like, of course you have this. Of course. Of course. So I just think it's a way to really express yourself. And, and I do believe that when you really know, like you said, who you are, you're able just to put on anything and feel the best. Mm -hmm. Like I always say it all the time, I am not six feet tall, but I like wearing oversized stuff. But if, if you would have said that I would have wanted to dress like this four or five years ago, I wouldn't have mm. because I would have been so conscious of like, Oh God, I don't want to look like this or look like that. But now I'm like, this is what I like. This is what it is. How do you, or what do you say to people to encourage them to really own who they are and then dress accordingly. Because I think some people, going back to the judgment thing, right? It's like they want to wear a cool outfit or they want to um, dress a certain way, but they're so afraid to be judged that they don't. Because I know I definitely was there. Yeah. And it wasn't until I found the strength in me as a human like to then own, this is who you are and screw everybody That's else. That's the answer. Who you are is everything. What you believe about yourself is everything. Oh, so true, girl. It's everything. So if you, if you believe that you may not be the certain way in an area, then it's going to show. So the biggest suggestion or advice is going back to the root of really believing and knowing who you are knowing that your cool outfit is not going to make you any cooler. Mm -hmm. Knowing that you just being you will make you cool, which in turn will make the outfit cool. Yeah. It's one of those things that it feels like uh, what came first, the chicken and the egg, because yeah. the more I changed the way I dressed, the better I felt about myself. The better I felt about myself, the more confidence I got. The more confidence I got, the more I was leaning into my fashion. That's it. It's just, it's a domino effect. Yeah, it really is. It's simply a, do but again, it goes back to you knowing who you mm -hmm. are. You couldn't be doing this today with me if you didn't know who you were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, and another thing that for me, at least with fashion, is really owning my, um, my sexuality. Mm -hmm. I was definitely like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I'm married, so I shouldn't be dressing too sexy. It's like, now, screw it. I just like, if I, <laughs> <laughs> if I want to dress sexy, I'm going to dress sexy. I'm and dress the way I want to dress, it doesn't matter. But I really did. I was like, is this inappropriate because I'm married? Yeah. Is this inappropriate because, you know, my, maybe even my partner doesn't like this outfit. And it's like, oh, well, he doesn't like it. Should I still wear it? Yeah. Um, have you ever felt like that? Because you're married, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, it, it, that's obviously between you and your husband. And we've never had that issue. Mm. But, you know, I think the the suggestion to people that, that maybe do is, is being able to respect one another. And whatever that boundary is with that other person, that's the boundary. Yeah, I like that. Because, yeah, I mean, I definitely try... Uh, you know, work to absolutely respect him. And I, I've yeah. never worn anything, at least that he's told me of, that has been crossing that boundary. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we were going on a date. We'd been married for years. And we were going on a date and I wore a top and he looked at me and he's like, eh, no, I don't like it. And in that moment, I was like, do I change or do I stick with it? Because it was an absolute... So what did you do? So I asked myself, what is my purpose of wearing this shirt? Is it to catch his eye and like get him excited? Or is it because I want you to feel a certain way today going on this date? And I asked myself the question. I was like, no, I really want to look hot for my husband. So I'm like, I'll happily change it. But that, 
that's the difference. I mean, the, that's the that's mm. the balance. That's the juxtaposition of if if you feel like your husband just saying that because he just doesn't like the color, but then to me, I'm still gonna wear it. Or if you're wearing it simply to make yourself feel good in that moment, I think you should do, you should keep it on. Mm. It's just, it's case by case, in my opinion. It's definitely case by case, and I think the radar can simply be why you're wearing it, like you said, that's a great question, and just the respect factor. Mm. Do you, when you get dressed, let's say for a show like this, or things that, you know, other things that you're doing, do what are the things you ask yourself, and how do you decide on what to wear? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I have a uniform now. Okay. I realize that I have a uniform. It's for sure blazers. It's a lot of blazers denim and then obviously a good shoe so i think i want to one i'll probably always stay in my uniform but i want to i want to know what story i want to tell okay go on so today it's simply chic power i feel when i wear this i feel power so for me it's what story do you want to tell and how do you want to represent yourself yeah as i transitioned from being the housewife to an entrepreneur I really did ask myself that every morning. Like, what do you want to feel today? Yeah. Do you want to feel powerful? Do you want to feel cute? Do you want to be positioned as the boss? Do you want to position yourself as the wife? Like, I really, even now, like, every day I kind of ask myself wow. that question. So what do you normally gear towards? Really, it's like, what mood am I in? Like, I try to start there because then I'm just going back to what you were saying about your gut feeling. Like, I just want to go to my gut. Like, what mood am I in? Yeah. I really want to wear sweatpants today. Oh, but I've got a shoe. How am I going to wear sweatpants and a shoe? And that's when I'm like, oh, I can pull out my great ninja sweatpants, yeah. which are kind of, you know, fancy. For, and so I just navigate yeah, like sure. that. Um, but on some days where I'm not feeling great, so I've been battling for health issues for about four years now. Mm. And there are days where I'm just sick and I just don't feel well. I can't eat and I feel weak. And so that's another time where I'll be like, I want to feel like such a badass today. What mm. is my toughest outfit? Yeah. And I'm going to put that on. And I put it on and it, it is like Superwoman with her cape. Yeah. I'm gonna, you know, it's, I get it. You just feel it, it. The chemicals, it changes in your body. It does. But I, the chemicals change in your body because of what you're mm. thinking of, about yourself and what you're putting on and what you believe that, that what that is. If you believe and know that that's going to make you feel like a bad woman, if I believe in, oh, this is gonna make me feel power, everything shifts, your, your gestures shift, mm -hmm. but it goes back to what you believe. Yeah. It goes back to your thought process. I love that. Yeah. So what is um, the future for you? What does your show look like? Have you, are you doing more series? So we just wrapped season one, and now uh, in between for preparing for season two. Okay, have you got mm -hmm. people lined up? Are the people that, not yet. Okay, do you do like what your, how do you approach that, in fact? Is it like what you're selfishly, who you selfishly want to talk to? Or who it, empowers it's you? It's who I know will really give me the truth and the truth that I know that the world needs to hear and obviously their impact. Mm. So right now I definitely have like a list and then go through the list and then see who I believe is, is what, where the generation is today and who they need to hear from. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So what generation do you look at? Like culture, because okay. I believe that the culture influences everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, it's who is influencing the culture and what, who, or who can impact the culture. And once the, the culture is impacted, the world changes. I love that you're touching on different types of people. Mm -hmm. That's so important. Mm -hmm. So like from athletes to entertainment. Well, that's the point. It's a universal message. Mm -hmm. This message it isn't just for the athlete or isn't just for the modeling industry or the fashion industry. It's a message for everybody. But it may look different, but it's for everybody. Yeah, the, the battle that you're taking on really is absolutely universal mm -hmm. like identity I think every single human being struggles has, with struggles it. has to deal with it struggles with really knowing who they are and really knowing their purpose and and again like I said if you don't have those two you don't realize why you're here mm -hmm. so identity and purpose you can rule the world once you know who you are and why you're here you can rule the world but we are in such a identity crisis where our, we are so unstable because our identity is on all the wrong things. Mm. I always say, how can you expect stability from a broken identity? Yeah. Well, girl, I, I think you've got a lot of superpowers, but if you had to choose one, what would you choose? What is your superpower? 
I love that question. I think I have a gift of discernment mm -hmm. and the going back to the instinct and really hearing and knowing my gut and a gift with people. I think those are my superpowers. That's awesome. And so where can everybody find you and your show? Yes, yeah, so Hillsong Channel uh, every Sunday night or hillsongchannel.com backslash Natalie. My Instagram is Natalie Manuel Lee or the show Now with Natalie or Hillsong Channel. Amazing. Yes. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. Guys, you got to go check out this woman. you got to <laughs> go check out her series that she's already put out. It is so freaking good. She's an amazing interviewer. She really does go deep to bring out the truth. Like she keeps talking about, it's the truth about identity and what people have to do and what their purpose is. So go check it out. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billy. And if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, guys, go be the hero of your own life life. Peace out. What up guys, Lisa here. Thanks so much for watching this episode. And if you haven't already subscribed, click that little bell right in front of you. Click, click, click away. We release episodes every Wednesday, so be sure to get notified. Till next time, go be the hero of your own life.